Good morning, and welcome to the Finance Committee of the Mackinac Bridge Authority. Today is October 1st. The meeting is beginning a few minutes late, 9.02 a.m. Um, we have the agenda for today's meeting in front of you that was provided previously. May I ask for a member of the Finance Committee to make a motion to approve today's agenda? Amy, I'll make the motion to approve the agenda. Thank this you. Is Kirk. Is there a second? I support. Thank you, Bill. So moved, uh, the agenda is approved for today, so we'll get right into it. The first item um, is an informational update from Treasury. We have an investment update as well as an economic report, which we're all on pins and needles waiting to hear. Uh, and Woody is going to be leading this presentation. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, Lon will initially kind of kick off and do the investment update, and then I'll follow up with the economic um, outlook after that. So Lon, I'll turn it over to you right now. Thanks, Woody. Good morning, everyone. Um, could you please turn to slide three? Uh, this slide provides a nice look back at where the markets have been. This table highlights recent performance across asset classes along the risk spectrum, beginning with the lowest risk um, asset, the 90-day T-bill. And as you move down along the column, the riskiness of each asset class increases. The expectation here is that we should receive a higher yield for taking on the additional risk, known as a risk premium. Um, the next few columns show annualized returns over a one-year, three-year, five-year, and 10-year period. Typically, we'd see the returns over each period increase along uh, as you go down the column, uh, relatively riskless from the 90-day T-bill down to the, risk, the riskiest listed here, the S&P 500 stocks. But if you look at the returns for the government long bonds, um, which is the second uh, row down, you can see that um, the one-year performance of 12.9% per, 12 and impressively along the way, 10.8%, 8.4%, and 7.3% over the 10-year period. Um, this return has leapfrogged over the Barclays Ag as well as the Bloomberg Corporate High Yield um, Indices. It only comes second to the S&P 500 stock market. So what does this mean for um, the portfolio? Well, it's it's very good for the current performance of the portfolio, but going forward, um, the expectation is that the returns for this asset class will be lower. So with that, could you please turn to the second slide, please? This next slide shows the portfolio's asset allocation. And although the portfolio is limited to government securities, we have div diversified the portfolio um, across type of investment, issuer, and maturity date. With uh, almost 40% in government-backed mortgages, 26% in treasury bonds, 15% um, in credit, government credit bonds, and 18% in cash. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have the interest income over the next 12 months for this portfolio. It's estimated to be 2.3% which represents a um, 2% return on a $119 million portfolio. The current uh, average uh, rate of return for the, the bonds that we have in the portfolio is 2.5%. But again, with rates being as low as they are, when we reinvest bonds that mature, um, you'll see that we'll be reinvesting into a lower rate environment. Next slide, please. Here we have the performance for the portfolio. If you look on the, the far right highlighted, we have the total fund performance with one year performance nearly 8%. This is primarily um, due to appreciation from lowered interest rates that happened um, with the onset of COVID-19. The Federal Reserve was very aggressive in lowering, lowering the federal funds rate uh, by 150 basis points. So uh, the impact is a teeter-totter effect, if you will, for bonds as rates in increase, 
you'll see that, um, I'm sorry, as rates decrease, you'll see that the market values of the portfolio will, will increase. Next slide, please. Uh, here we show the increase in market value gradually over time, um, ending at the end of August with 119.1 million. Next slide, please. Here we show um, the composition of the portfolio over time with increases coming from interest income, contributions, and most recently, market value appreciation. Maybe I'll pause here for any questions. Next slide, please. Um, here we show the correlation of the portfolio versus 10-year treasuries. Um, you can see, broadly speaking, the, the similar ebb and flow between the 10-year treasury versus the income that's earned on this portfolio. And if you look at the trend of that 10-year treasury, um, the blue line on the bottom, you can see that it's gradually declining. Um, and so the impact on the portfolio is we, we, we expect the, the interest income to gradually um, decline in line with the 10-year treasury. Next slide, please. Um, we opened the presentation with a look back at uh, where the 10-year treasuries have been and generally speaking where the, the markets have been. Um, here we, we wanted to show you currently what the, the market conditions are. And if you look at um, the top table with the 10-year treasury, uh, the current yield as of the end of the first half of 2020 is 0.66%. So going forward, th this is uh, the rate environment that we'll be investing in. And so the 10-year is uh, sort of the, the foundational building block for which all other asset classes are um, priced off of. And so with rates being as low as they are for the 10-year, the expectation is that all other at class, all other asset classes will fall in line um, and similarly be lowered uh, for future returns. Woody will have a little bit more discussion on um, rates going forward in his economic review. So with that, maybe um, if there are no other questions, I'll turn it over to Woody. Thank you, Lon. Um, if we could go to the economic outlook and then the first slide on the agenda. So we have the economic outlook, which no surprise here, um, that first bullet point is gonna be very much dependent on the outlook for the virus. And, and that's really predominantly, you know, in our talking with most economists that we speak with, they're really looking for the benefits of hopefully a vaccine um, and then better therapeutics and certainly better safety measures by being practiced by individuals that will reap sort of those rewards, so to speak, in 2021. So the current phase of the recovery is going to be really the most challenging. And, and, and most economists that we speak with are sort of in agreement with that. Um, and if you think back, you know, when we met, and I know some of you are new to the board, but when we met back in March, we had a much more sort of uh, bleak forecast for the economy because we that we were on the edge of the pandemic sort of breaking out. And it actually, the second quarter GDP turned out to be much worse than, than many people, if not all people were expecting. We had a negative 32% GDP quarter and a spike in the unemployment rate to nearly 20% in that second quarter. Then we met in July and, and we spoke of the economy picking up. Um, and yes, it did pick up much more than what we'd expected and most economists expected. And we'll likely, we haven't booked it yet, we just ended the third quarter, but the expectations are for the third quarter GDP to be up nearly 25%, maybe even more. Um, I think many people have accused economists of torturing the data. I think in this case, the economists are being tortured by the data. 
So we're having, you know, you can just use all sorts of superlatives. We've had the biggest economic drop in this nation's history since the Great Depression, and then followed by the greatest economic recovery in a quarter. Um, and, and same, similar could be said for the unemployment rates. So it has been an unusual environment. Now, as we look at the fourth quarter, it's gonna be a little more challenging. Um, not, we're not expecting anything close to the magnitude of what we saw in the second and third quarter, um, likely to be low single digits. We just don't know if it's gonna be a positive or a negative side on that. So that's where the question is. But as we move into 2021, we do look for the benefits of hopefully again a vaccine and some of the implementation of testing, better practices, better therapeutics to really benefit the economy as we grow into 2021. Part of the issue would be on the job market, and we'll touch on this. Um, the expectations are for a little longer recovery. We're at about 8%, 8.4% unemployment right now. That's going to take a little longer, primarily because we've we've kind of put people back to work in the areas less impacted by COVID, but the areas that are significantly impacted, namely entertainment, travel, leisure, hotels, restaurants, are going to take longer to recover. And there's no surprise there. And we saw it yesterday with Disney's announcement of layoffs in their theme parks. Um, two airlines announced at the end of the quarter that they're going to be also furloughing people um, and similar, we saw that with Marathon and Royal Dutch Petroleum, an area not obviously in the leisure or entertainment area, but obviously energy is negatively impacted by uh, the current economy and the current COVID issue. Um, we, we have some information from the research seminar on the quantitative economics at the University of Michigan. We'll talk about the Michigan economy. Uh, and then the outlook, as Lon indicated, for interest rates. We do get a difference here in terms of the, uh, the economists that we speak with. Um, most of them, I would say, are expecting rates to remain lower for longer, but there are a couple out there expecting interest rates to move up um, as we move through 2021 and certainly beyond. Uh, next page, please. So we have reasons for optimism. Um, probably should have prefaced this by saying long term. Uh, we did, again, as mentioned earlier, expect most of the benefits of uh, what is being invested in right now in terms of potential vaccines, testing, to really benefit and come to fruition in 2021. Um, if you look sort of toward the bottom of this page, we have seen benefits. If, you know, early summer, uh, this is a seven-day rolling average of new cases. We we're up over 75,000 midsummer, and we've trended down as we've moved through this year and at the end of August. It appears we're plateauing around um, the 40 to 45,000 uh, per day level. We'll see if that holds. Hopefully, it does. Um, but the uncertainty is as we move into this period of peak flu season, which typically kind of picks up in November and begins to kind of taper down late January, February. Um, people going back, or students going back to, to college and into um, to high school and grade school, uh, just the probability and potential for spread of the virus increases, obviously. And we're seeing that at many universities um, as was being talked about earlier in this discussion. Um, we really won't know if we're through that until sometime late January, as we can begin to kind of wind down and come off that. Uh, and we're keeping our fingers crossed, hopefully we do. There are positive signs if we look at um, the Southern Hemisphere, which has gone just kind of coming through their, the end of their winter, places like New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, they did have a very mild, relatively speaking, flu season, and hopefully again, COVID ties in with that, um, due to many people taking preventative flu shots, uh, as well as just following the mitigation measures of social distancing, wearing masks, and hand washing. Next page, please. 
So you can see here, we talked about this um, leveling off of unemployment. Uh, if you look to that chart at the bottom of the page, you can see sort of early 2020, we had a 3.5% unemployment rate that actually spiked up mid-month in April to just over 20%. Um, but then at the end of April, it was 14.7% as we, you know, as the nation really kind of pulled back um, from the closings and then dropped to 8.4%. But as you can see, sort of that second bullet point, um, this is from uh, Jerome Powell of the Fed chair, it will likely take years before we fully recover. And he is talking about that if you look down below. We have 11 million people who are currently not yet back to work. And these are primarily in the harder to fill jobs, primarily hotel, entertainment, and travel related industries as we talked about earlier. So the Fed is continuing to keep interest rates low for an extended period of time. And they claim that this will be measured in years. And what they are looking for is for inflation to move up meaningfully above 2% and for the unemployment rate to come back down. Uh, next page, please. And, and this is the reason why it's just going to be a longer recovery from where we are, that 8.4%. Um, unemployment rate. And if you look, you can see um, it, it's really that hotel, entertainment, transportation, the service sector, so to speak, which normally in, in a down economy holds up well. It's the manufacturing side of the economy that usually is bearing the shock absorber of, you know, higher unemployment and, and having to cut back. Um, but it's the COVID crisis. So this is an unusual or more unusual environment. If, if you look in the right-hand side, these industries make up um, just under 20% of GDP at $4.2 trillion. Down below that, you can see they also make up 20% of employment. Um, and so roughly 31 million. And it really is in this area um, that we're going to have the toughest time as we move forward uh, in, in terms of bringing those jobs back. Um, but hopefully, and again, expectations are very high and, and we're seeing encouraging data on vaccines. Um, and the expectations are for those to be implemented um, as we roll through in 2021 and hopefully by mid-year, certainly 2021, um, most of the nation will, will be um, reaping the benefit of that, so to speak. Um, next page, please. Um, I thought, uh, I wasn't sure to put this chart, if I wanted to put this chart in, I did, but I thought it was interesting. Um, it shows the percentage change in consumer spending. That red line is just lower income uh, groups actually up on the year, which is encouraging, up 1.1%, um, primarily, again, getting some of the benefit of, of the federal stimulus. Down below that is um, the higher net worth individuals actually down 7.5%. But this is also weighing on um, those sectors. You think of the incremental spend of high net worth individuals and it tends to go to travel, leisure, entertainment, um, and, and hotels. So uh, this is the area that we may need to see that pick up. Not that these people may, you know, the, the high net worth individuals are suffering so much, but it's just, there's lack of willingness to travel. So low interest rates really may not help uh, this sector so much. Low interest rates are certainly helping certain sectors, especially the housing industry, but these sectors won't benefit really until we get some sort of resolution of COVID. Uh, and so likely we will need more federal stimulus to, to assist this group as we move through the remainder of this year and into 2021. Um, next page, please. Uh, for some of you, I know, uh, may be new to this meeting, but I apologize to others who have sat in on these presentations because we've talked about the shape of the U.S. recovery. Um, and right now, we settled on the square root recovery. If you look at that red line below, that's that's the current e economy. <clears throat> excuse me, economy that we're in. Looks a little bit like a square root sign. Um, you can see we had that dramatic drop sort of in the second quarter and then the dramatic uplift in the third quarter. 
But from here, because it's going to be harder to get those people back to work, it likely will bend the slower growth than what we've, um, what we've experienced certainly in the past quarter. The sort of, I'm horrible with colors, but that bottom line, I think it's um, kind of an olive green or yellow. I'm not sure what, uh, I'm, I can see the color. I'm just don't know names of colors, but um, my wife would be better at this. Uh, that is the 2007 sort of recovery from the great financial crisis. That did take longer to occur, but really the, you look at the impact and who was hit by that, and it, it was primarily middle America, all of America in general, but especially you know, the, the, the people who were impacted the most in terms of their net wealth being impacted. It was middle to lower income individuals who saw their housing values drop. And that just took longer for that recovery to occur because it was just a massive write down and a massive impact or shock, uh, negative wealth impact to people. And so a much longer period of recovery than what we're expecting for our, our current sort of COVID crisis. And, and I'll pause there. I know I've been kind of moving through these slides quickly, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer any as best I can. Okay, um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, Michigan economy, again, we, we got this information from the University of Michigan. Um, if you turn to the next page, um, Michigan, usually, you know, when the nation sneezes, um, the Michigan economy sort of contracts a, a flu, just as, as long as I guess we're staying on topic. Um, but the Michigan economy has held up very well, and again, partly due to manufacturing being a little more resilient, specifically looking at the auto industry. You can see in that chart to the right, you know, for the past four plus years, we've been trending around that 7 million mark for light vehicle sales that include both autos and light trucks. But then we did have this dramatic drop down below 10 million because of COVID, COVID because of the shutdown. But the expectations are for that to pick back up so that estimated production on average for 2020 is estimated to be around 13 million. Um, the auto industry has done a much better job in terms of, you know, really cutting their costs from the great financial crisis. GM estimated that um, if you look back at the great financial crisis in 2008, uh, auto sales dropped below 10 million, and that sent the three auto companies into bankruptcy. Um, Mary Barra announced years back um, that they had cut costs enough that at 10 million units for the US, they estimated GM would break even. So that's a very, very positive sign uh, for the industry and certainly as we move forward. You know, the challenges for them and not just, uh, it, it's true any of the legacy automakers, whether they're in Japan, Germany or the US, um, is the challenge as they move forward in terms of new technologies, whether it's related to electrical vehicles or automation. And you're seeing things at the bottom of this page, the last bullet point, um, joint ventures between GM and Honda to sort of defray part of that cost over their, um, their entire sort of revenue structure. Um, and GM also uh, announced a couple of weeks back um, after this went to print, a deal with Nikola. Um, that one's a little more, I don't know what to tell you on that. Um, they didn't put up $2 billion in cash for it. And I just, uh, that's known. They, they, that was more of a deal to produce um, the EV trucks for Nikola, but, um, and that was based on the valuation of Nikola at that time. We'll, we'll see if that, that turns out to be a good deal. I know that's sort of uh, being renegotiated by GM right now. Um, next page, please. Uh, Michigan consumer, again, um, good news. Uh, you can see at the bottom of this page, um, this is definitely from the University of Michigan. You can see the uh, maize and blue on, the, on this page. Um, the blue in, uh, is, the US, or is the Michigan consumer um, actually showing positive uh, spending, which is great, um, while the rest of the country sort of lags behind. 
Um, part of that may be a mix of the labor force in the US, uh, or in Michigan, I'm sorry. Um, and, and that may be a challenge as we move forward, uh, just as, again, you know, uh, a greater portion of that employment base may be in that, that sort of entertainment um, and leisure area. Um, next page, please. Michigan unemployment, um, no surprise here, behaved very similar similarly to the uh, the national economy. Um, we were up at roughly 4.4 million people employed, and then it just plummeted by 800,000 to 3.6 million. Um, we've seen a recovery of roughly 500,000 since then, but you can see that we're not going to continue that rapid recovery. It, it's bending, um, so the, uh, the the incremental change here um, is, is slowing the slope, so to speak. Um, they're looking, they, the University of Michigan, um, are expecting um, that will continue to grow this into early 2022, just to about 4.3 million, um, still about 100,000 short uh, of where we were at the beginning of this year. And that may indicate sort of an unemployment rate of five to 6%. Um, and that may be in line with what the Federal Reserve has been talking about for the nation as a whole, with the expectations of uh, about 4% plus unemployment uh, during that period. Next page, please. Uh, Michigan personal income as well, we were at, um, Roughly 520 million uh, before we went into the, the the downdraft, so to speak, in the second quarter of this year, and and that dropped to just over 500 million. Um, University of Michigan expectations are for this to ramp back up and get to about 540 million um, as we roll into 2022. So expectations are again, most economists that we speak with are really in line with this. Um, expecting that recovery to really begin and continue as we move through 2021. Uh, next page, please. So touching on interest rates, which is, you know, as Lon kind of alluded to, we have seen a major benefit here um, to this portfolio in general, but the expectations as we move forward um, you know, we want to trim those. We're not going to continue to get 7% annualized rates of return. Uh, that came primarily, um, I think I, I've used the analogy before. If you think of um, interest rates and the value of a bond portfolio as being a teeter-totter, so as interest rates go down, the value of the bond portfolio moves up. Um, it also works in reverse. But um, what we're looking at here is, and I, I left a question mark here, lower for longer, um, how much, how longer is longer, we'll, we'll have to define. But if you look back at that green chart, um, I believe that's green, apologies again, that's the US. Back in November of 2018, we were just at 3% and it traded down primarily because the economy had been 10 years into recovery and we're beginning to see really problematic issues in terms of employing people and, and, and it just wasn't growing as fast. So interest rates began to drop during 2019. And then, you know, we began to see a little bit of a pickup as we moved toward the end of 2019 and as we moved into 2020. And then you can see that spike down. Um, we're currently on the 10 year, as I mentioned, we we're at 3% um, at the end of 2000 or November of 2018. We're currently at 0.65%. Now I've included Germany and Japan on here um, because they are in the negative rate territory. And the Federal Reserve has indicated they do not want or think that we should move to negative rates. And, and I think that that's sound a sound argument because if you look at those rates, those negative rates, they were not really able to drop off any more than where they, they have. They've basically sort of been flatline or trendlining a little bit with the exception of, of Germany. But um, they're really, I think they, this is really kind of a sign that your monetary policy is no longer working and it wreaks havoc 
within the financial system because it, it just, I still can't get my mind around how you try to work through a negative interest rate and, and how people borrow and you actually pay them money to do that. Um, and you're not seeing the benefits of that really work through their economies. So the Fed does not plan to go to negative rates um, and we don't expect them to. Uh, next page, please. Slide. So higher inflation, higher rates, there's the question and there's where we're starting to get some sort of different of viewpoints from the economists that we speak with. At the bottom of this page, you, you have the five-year break-even inflation rate and, and you basically take the nominal five-year treasury bond, which pays you a fixed amount, and then you subtract from that the five-year TIP or treasury inflation protection bond which will give you a rate of return plus the rate of inflation. So, you know, this is, is, we should basically have an implicit forecast if we take that nominal five-year rate minus that five-year tip, which indicates what the market is telling us inflation will be. And you see that in this chart. Um, and by the way, you know, if, if the markets felt differently, um, if they felt that inflation were moving higher, they would buy more tips than they do um, five year and, and the five year rate should move up and the tip rates um, in theory could move down more. Uh, but what we, we're looking at is that inflation sort of forecast. And you can see really since um, October of 2009, it's been bouncing around between sort of one and a half to 2%. And as we rolled into this year, we took that dramatic dip down towards zero Certainly what was happening with the economy was deflationary. Um, and then certainly with the, the federal stimulus and the Federal Reserve stimulus, we've seen that move back up to one and a half percent. So we're exiting sort of that deflation stage and hopefully moving back to reflation. Um, and the expectations are to move back up above 2% as the global economy picks up. Um, the Fed is sort of indicated, as we mentioned earlier, the central banks around the world really are looking to temporarily overshoot on inflation. So even if it remains above 2%, the Fed has indicated that they will sort of maintain the stimulus um, as long as it's sort of slightly above 2%. Um, next page, please. And this is, this is from the University of Michigan forecast. Um, so the outlook for interest rates, uh, and, and you can see that second bullet point is from the Dallas Fed president, Robert Kaplan. They look for short-term rates, he in particular, but speaking for the Fed in general, um, looks for interest rates to remain near zero bound on the short side, that short interest rate. You can see that dotted line in the bottom of the page at 0.11%. They're looking for that to maintain at that level for about two and a half to three years. The, um, then we should get above trend line growth as we talked about in 2021. That is sort of the Fed's view as well. And then they expect that the unemployment rate could hit maybe three and a half percent. We talked about potentially dropping at, down to about just over 4% in 2022, and then hopefully move down to about three and a half percent um, by 2023. But looking back down at that chart again, and, and again, what we're looking at, the top chart is the conventional mortgage bond or mortgage rate. Um, down below that, the yellow line is the 10-year treasury, and then the dotted dashed line uh, are short-term rates. Um, so by the end of this year, we're looking at that 10-year to remain at about 0.65 and probably a great time to, to go out and get a mortgage loan. Um, as we move through 2021, expectations are for that to pick up to 0.9 on the 10-year treasury. And then likewise, a, a slight increase um, on the, in the mortgage rates as well. But short-term rates remaining near that 0.11%. Um, I, I would say this is probably a conservative forecast, I, I'm, and I'm hoping, and I think the Fed is actually hoping um, that they're wrong here and that as we move through 2021, there is an incredible amount, if the economy does begin to recover, there is an incredible amount of stimulus out there coming from both the Federal Reserve 
in the federal government, the expectations are for the federal government next year to run about a $2 trillion budget deficit. And that is simply being monetized by the Fed, who is buying the bonds as the Fed issues those. And so that is a huge stimulus to the economy. Um, we haven't felt it because of the negative drag, certainly of COVID, and it's been the right thing to do. But as we move into next year, if the economy does pick up, it'll be interesting to see um, what the bond market does with that incredible amount of stimulus out there. And, and that, again, is 2021. The expectations are we could run another $2 trillion deficit as we move into 2022. So again, federal stimulus, federal reserve stimulus, um, COVID, hopefully, and we believe it will be abating. So strong stimulus out there um, could impact rates much more significantly than what this forecast is implying. Um, next page, please. So economic outlook, we usually talk about what we thought, you know, where the potential weaknesses are, but I, we usually do this and we do uh, do an equity analysis, a base case, an upside case, and a downside case. But we also do it for our economy or economic forecast too. Um, the base case really, I would say 60 plus percent um, uh, probability is the U.S. economy recovers as we sort of implied in this discussion. Um, with the headwinds that are coming from the business closures. And I didn't mention that, but uh, unfortunately, one in five restaurants could potentially close. And, and we're seeing closures in retail. And again, the struggles within um, that sector of the economy, the, the service sector. Um, U.S. corporate profits have fallen 25%, primarily financials and the service sector, as we talked about. But we look for a good recovery as we move into 2021. Um, the upside case would be that V-shaped recovery. And, you know, we'd give this a lower probability of occurring and, and the same with the downside case, which we'll get to in a second, but probably a, let's call it a 15 to 20% chance. Um, this would just be a rapid recovery. Maybe we get, you know, the vaccine sooner than what people expect. And that would bring in the airlines, the hotels and restaurants and we'd see this rapid drop in the unemployment rate and inflation would likely become an issue um, faster than what um, certainly the University of Michigan uh, or that, that chart before it where I showed the, uh, the five-year implied forecast um, is, is assuming. In the downside case, uh, again, I would give this a lower probability, 15% sort of case uh, as fiscal policy dries up. We haven't you know, Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi and the Treasurer Mnuchin have, were talking yesterday. Um, nothing came from that, but fingers crossed that we do get something. But if fiscal policy were to dry up, not just this quarter, but it, as we move into next year, that would be a negative. Um, the other would be, and probably more importantly, or as importantly, the coronavirus wave rises again as we move into the fall and winter, and then we have more meaningful disruptions than what we were talking about. Uh, and in which case we would see, unfortunately, the unemployment rate would likely flatten or even increase. Again, that's not our base case forecast, um, but we kind of assign probabilities to this thing or to these, these outlooks. Um, it's an uncertain future uh, and that's sort of where we are. Um, and that that's, uh, that's the end of the uh, presentation. Um, optimistic, but, um, but you know, we certainly have a, the next three to four months are going to be interesting to say, to say the least. I'm happy to take any questions if there might be any. I think everybody's, I think everybody's suggesting. suggesting. Yeah, it's a lot of information. I know apologies, but, um, I, I, uh, I appreciate the detailed presentations for both you, Lon, and me. If there are no more questions, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Okay, great. I'm sorry, did someone have a question? No, okay. Uh, we will move on next to uh, the pandemic traffic and revenue trends. This is an informational presentation given by Executive Secretary Kim Nowak. Kim? Good morning, everyone. Um, 
I will not refer you to your packet because the information that we sent you in your packet is already outdated since we have the latest, greatest traffic information on the slides here. So we're going to look back uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. <clears throat> You've seen some of these charts before, but I, they're just so interesting. And um, they tell the story of our traffic at the bridge. They tell the story of our lives away from the bridge, what we were doing. They tell the story of um, the global uh, tolling agencies are experiencing the very same kind of traffic charts that um, we show here. And these charts are unprecedented in the history of the Mackinac Bridge and, and, and around the world. So we'll look back at March. Um, you can see the middle of March there where we all took a dive uh, down into our isolation and so did our traffic. Um, you can see we lost the weekend peaks because everyone went home and stayed safe and stayed isolated. Um, moving on to April, you can see that the April was a full month of staying home, staying isolated, but our trucking traffic continued. So even though our total traffic was down 63%, we still had only a 46% loss in revenue for April because the trucking, tra trucking traffic continued to deliver goods and services where they needed to go. Uh, next slide, please. In May, you can see that uh, the beginning of the month we were uh, staying isolated and no uh, weekend peaks there on the blue curve. But then towards the end of the month when Governor Whitmer uh, opened up some of the northern areas of the state um, and we were able to move around Michigan a little bit more, you can see we started to get some weekend peaks in there. Um, not quite as much as uh, last year, but we're mirror mirroring um, 2019 and just about 37% lower than 2019. And then in June, that trend continued where uh, people were vacationing and we have the pretty much the same exact peaks, uh, just 18% lower than 2019. Uh, next slide, please. July, you can see that our 2020 traffic is bumping up against the 2019 traffic. Uh, and so we only had a, uh, about a 7% decrease for the month of July. And then August, if you look at August, you can see where the um, 2020 actually surpassed 2019 for a couple of those uh, uh, weekends. And so we're right up tight to uh, the 2019 traffic with only about a 5% decrease. And it's important to note that in 2019, Labor Day was quite early in the year. So it was very early in September. So that peak there for 2019 was the northbound traffic coming north for the Labor Day holiday. Um, if we move to the latest information on the next slide, Melissa. And that is our September traffic, which is not audited yet, but you can see that um, uh, this year in September, Labor Day was later, and so all of the Labor Day traffic is in September. You can see that big um, peak there in blue. And then if you look at the last two weekends in September, our 2020 traffic actually surpassed 2019, which is pretty amazing um, uh, to me that this happened. So just looking at the isolated month of September with the traffic that we have right now is unaudited because it's just finished yesterday. So uh, we're almost 6% up from 2019 for just September. And so that changes those numbers that we looked at back in July and we looked at in your packet. And so now here on the screen, our fiscal 20 um, revenue as of August 31st, which is our last audited traffic information, uh, we're about a million nine lower than um, 2019. If you add in September, where we had the little bump of about 6%, and this is estimated based on unaudited traffic, uh, purely by the percentage, uh, we're going to gain 141,000 or so. So our total revenue loss for the fiscal, 20, fiscal year 20 is about a million eight. And if you, remember, if you remember back at the July meeting, um, we made a budget amendment uh, in our total budget for about 3.3 million. Uh, to offset the revenue deficiency. And so we have a cushion. Um, we did uh, a good job of, um, well, we were conservative in our estimate, which I guess we want to be on the conservative side of estimating our revenue loss. Um, 
But I will say again that these charts um, mirror what's going on in other tool agencies around around the country and around the world. Um, during the pandemic, IBTTA has been great at setting up webinars, seminars, coffee talks, all kinds of different things. And so I've heard from many tolling agencies, uh, most of which are way bigger than us. And um, the charts look very similar. Um, we are talking about revenue deficiencies using the M word of millions, and some of those are using the B word of billions, and which is a lot different. Um, and I'll mention too that we're thankful for our infrequent travelers and tourists that are bumping us up against 2019 numbers because many of the other toll agencies are reliant on daily commuter traffic. And as you know, most of us are commuting from our bedroom to our kitchen table in our fuzzy slippers. And so we're not hopping in our car and driving the toll roads or getting on the commuter train or driving, getting on the bus. And so agencies that rely on those things, they're not seeing their numbers touching 2019 numbers. And in fact, those that are reliant on commuter traffic are uh, not expecting to get back to 2019 numbers for several years. And I've even heard 2025 and 2026 is, is their estimate of when they'll get back up to 2019 numbers. So we're very lucky that way. Um, and those other agencies, uh, you know, they're looking at um, layoffs and furloughs and toll increases and loans and bonding and putting off their capital improvement projects. So um, we are quite lucky. Um, since Labor Day was so uh, split by the two months, I thought it would be good to look at the two months together. So, Melissa, if you change the slide, please. Um, if you combine August and September traffic um, to capture both of those Labor Day uh, scenarios between 2019 and 2020, um, traffic is down 0.7% when you combine those two months together, which is uh, a pretty good indication of how we might be looking going forward, especially with those last two weekends in September being above 2019. We're getting ready for the color season. We have some big weekends in October coming up. So um, I'll answer any questions about the traffic, but this is a good lead in into uh, Cami's portion where she's going to talk about how comfortable we are with our fiscal year 21 traffic projections. Kim, thank you so much. This is optimistic. I just have one question with the cushion that we have. Um, would you anticipate if we had that second wave of, of COVID coming through that that cushion would be enough based on our knowledge of getting us from March to here? Um, well, I guess it would depend on what a second wave looked like. If it was identical to uh, to the last wave. Um, Assuming it was, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that cushion is enough. Plus, we have cushion in our um, built into the to the next fiscal year budget. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there are no more questions for Kim, I think that this was just such a spectacular uh, and unexpected trend that we're very fortunate people continue to, to use this bridge um, for their weekends and, and I'm, I'm very optimistic moving forward. So everyone keep traveling <laughs> inside yes. Michigan. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Kim. Next, we will um, discuss the fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021 budget review. Uh, by the CFO of the Mackinac Bridge Authority uh, and Cami. Good morning, everybody. This um, table was put together to show you um, just a little bit about the traffic and what it would look like if we had a 1%, 5%, or a 10% um, decrease along with what the corresponding revenue would look like. So the Yellow column is what was approved by the board for the 2021 business plan. Um, with the traffic being um, based off from the 2020 original estimate plus a 0.75% increase. 
So that being said, our traffic count was budgeted at 4,297,372 with a corresponding um, revenue of 23,537,791. The blue bar at the bottom um, shows what our excess revenue over expenditures before transfers and capital outlay would be. For the approved 2021 business plan, we had an excess of revenue of $5,171,521, with capital outlay being at $1,497,000, and our budgeted transfer of $250,000. At a 1% decrease in traffic, we're looking at um, traffic counts lowered by 42,974 with a corresponding decrease in revenue of 235,378, causing a change in the excess revenue to 4,936,143. I think it's important that we keep referring back to this excess revenue because that is what allows us to look at the capital outlay and um, the ability to pay our transfers to the state. At a 5% decrease in revenue, we're looking at traffic counts being decreased by 214,869 vehicles with a corresponding revenue decrease of, um, let's see, 1,176,889 creating our um, excess revenue to 3,994,632. With a 10% decrease, we're looking at 429,737 vehicle decrease with a corresponding decrease in revenue of 2,353,779 creating the excess revenue over expenditures to be 2,817,742. Any questions on, on um, the information so far? Cammy, this is Kirk Steidel. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Um, presentation, uh, I feel much more comfortable uh, having seen this uh, now going into what could be a very turbulent 21 in, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, the excess revenue is, is what we've been generating over the years to help pay for that deck project. Uh, so uh, knowing that we're not going to have to dip into any of that uh, is frankly really uh, reassuring to me. So. Um, this is good numbers and, and thanks for the presentation. And I, um, in speaking with Kim and the rest of the team, um, our recommendation is to stay with the current 2021 um, budget numbers at this time, but that we need to revisit it again at our next board meeting as we monitor traffic and monitor um, Kim's great graphs that she puts together to make sure that we are either in line or um, need to look further into the decrease in traffic so you know one piece that could be helpful is as we look ahead what happens to our fund balance uh, uh, relative to you know the deck project you know kind of the sensitivity analysis that we've done in the past uh, just so that we see you know when the project comes do we have uh, enough cash or are we going to be in a spot where we have to borrow or something you know different than that that would be a nice analysis as well but, okay yeah, good good job keeping your eyes on it next slide so um with this slide it was requested to look at our purchasing schedule of our capital outlay we have one million four hundred ninety seven thousand in total capital outlay um, budgeted and as you can see most of the purchases are um, either scheduled in January or March um, and so with the largest being uh, largest purchase actually scheduled for possibly September if that 
And so um, we think that we would be able to monitor our traffic our, if we um, look to decrease our traffic and we can actually revisit this list if and determine the absolute necessity of each purchase. So any questions? I like that idea, Ken. This is Amy uh, Trehe. Uh, it looks like one of the things that we voted on for the amendment in July that's not showing up here um, as being kind of put back in as a need was the deck grading materials. And I don't know if that's a question maybe for Julie or Kim um, to just understand the importance of that. If that need is there, should that be showing up um, somewhere as far as an allocation? Um, the deck grading material shows up in our projects. It doesn't show up in our equipment purchasing. Okay, and great. So that's that's where it appears in the amendment. And, and um, Julie's going to be getting going on that uh, quite shortly here and order some new deck grading materials. So okay, it's already taken into account. That's all I had. Anything else for uh, Tammy? Uh, yeah, Tracy. Uh, uh, Amy, this is Kirk. So, uh, uh, Tammy, uh, I really like that the reach all is, is out in September, you know, really gives us a chance to see what happens. Uh, and you know, that can be the way it frankly is what, probably 70, 80% of the budget. So uh, nice job of pushing that out. And, and I know you'll continue to watch and make adjustments as you go. So you know, good stewardship. Thank you. And for our next um, meeting, if we purchase anything, I will um, put the purchase date on here so you can see what's been purchased and and what we still have left to purchase. So. Perfect. Thank you so much, Cami. Um, if there are no other questions for Cami, I'll open it up to see if there's any other discussion by any of the finance committee members. Nothing from me. Thank you. Member Seidel. Me either. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, next, we'll open it up to um, public comment. And James and Monica, you uh, can give us an update if there's anything showing uh, up on your end. Through email, we did receive a public comment, but it is probably uh, more appropriate for the, the full board to consider it is not a finance matter. OK, well, we'll defer that to the board meeting. Uh, the official board meeting, which will occur today in about a half an hour. Um, the board meeting, official board meeting is at 1030. So we will be taking a 30 minute break uh, between the finance committee and that official board meeting. Um, it's recommended that the, the board members keep your uh, computers running. You can turn your video off and, and put it on mute um, and then come back and sit down after you stretch your legs at 1030 for the official meeting. And with that, um, I appreciate everyone for their time. A lot of great information, much more optimistic than our July meeting. So that feels really nice. Um, and with that, we'll close the Finance Committee meeting for October 1st, uh, 2020. Thank you, Amy.
Good morning. The Mackinac Bridge Authority official meeting will now be called to order. Today's date is October 1st, 2020. The first uh, item on the agenda is a motion is an order for, to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Second by Trahey. It's been moved and supported that the agenda be approved as presented. If, is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by aye, or excuse me, Kim, uh, just for the sake of uh, clarity, uh, would you call roll on all action items from our executive mm -hmm. secretary, please? Yes, I will. Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Present. Yes. Sorry. Director Ajaba? Yes. Member Steidel? Member Steidel? Kirk, are you on, are you muted? Um, I'll go back to okay. Member Steidel. Oh, Member Steidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. Member Cheeseman? Yes. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I would also like just to note for the record that all members are present for today's meeting. Uh, all of you have a copy of the minute meeting minutes uh, from the July 10th, 2020. It was official board meeting on July 10th. A motion also be in order to accept the minutes as presented. I'll make that motion, Trisha Kinley. Milliken supports. It's been moved and supported that both meeting minutes be approved as presented. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, our executive secretary, if she would call roll again, please. Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Yes. Director Ajaba? Yes. Member Steidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. And Member Cheeseman? Yes. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, public comment on agenda only. James, Monica, were there any uh, comments from the public pertaining to today? agenda mr chair we have not received any public comments to this point uh, that refer to action items on the agenda thanks Jim. item four under old business is informational from our executive secretary kim nowak in reference to the tower painting project thank you um, I will refer you to tab four in your um, board packet for some detailed information about the tower project. But before I get into that, I want to uh, call your attention to the um, the slide template we've been using during the today's board meeting. Um, we have in the past used a variety of templates and each one of us uh, creates our slides and gives them to Melissa to work her magic and try to make something out of it. But this time uh, we solicited James Lake's help to get a professional looking template. And so we'd like to thank Brian Whitfield from the um, graphic arts uh, dot mapping and media who helped uh, create this template and some others you'll see in other meetings. And so you'll remember Brian is was instrumental in designing the license plate that featured the Mackinac Bridge. So we're thankful for his efforts towards our professional looking presentation today. 
Uh, the South Tower project, uh, we've had some news since our last meeting with you in July. Uh, the project is about 70% complete. And um, a month or so ago, after following the annual inspection work that was done, uh, we determined a need to do some uh, grading work in the exact area of the Seaway uh, painting project. And so we began negotiations with them on uh, talking about where they can move their equipment and how we might fit in at the same area. And since they need the outside uh, lane for their equipment and we need the inside lane for our work, uh, it was going to be very complicated and they were going to have to move quite a ways away and pipe their materials back to the project site. And so, um, since we also had a couple months of delay this springtime from COVID, um, we looked at um, uh, suspending their work for the year, giving them an uh, extension of time, and um, having them come back next year to finish the project. So that's what we did. They finished the one leg that you see here in the picture. And uh, as I said, about 70% complete. They uh, left the project and Julie will tell you more about the work that we got to do once they were gone from there and their new completion date will be uh, at the end of July next year. So this is definitely a win-win for both of us because of the work we needed to do there before winter and the other thing it does is with the two-year warranty on these projects that start at the completion date our two-year warranty won't start till uh, next summer so we're actually getting extension of a warranty on the 70% of work that's already been completed. So that's always good. So um, this was a good solution for us um, to work with on this project. Um, one more slide, Melissa, please. Also in your packet, I described some kind of late breaking news about another award that the uh, those innovative painting platforms uh, won. If you remember from previous meetings, they've already run uh, like three different awards uh, for the design of those painting platforms. And they've gotten a, another one from the National Council of Structural Engineers Associations. And so they received the 2020 Excellence in Structural Engineering Award. And this puts them in the running to receive the Outstanding Project Award which is a quite a um, prestigious award. And that will be announced later this fall, and I believe at a um, conference of sorts in November. So we're excited to see if they win yet again another award. And it's interesting to note that um, these platforms, as you can see on the tower there, uh, once they were done being used on both of our towers, They've since been dismantled and scrapped, so they're they're no longer in existence, but they're still winning awards. So, pretty exciting. We hope they hope they win another one. So I'll answer any questions if you have on the South Tower painting project. Well, thank you, Kim. Uh, that's all good news, and it's certainly uh, it's, it's good to know that everything is on time and on schedule up there, especially with the uh, COVID situation that uh, the maintenance people as well as the contractors have been dealing with. That's that's all good news. Is there any other comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll now hear from our chief engineer, Julie. She will be addressing the annual fracture uh, critical inspection. It's an informational item. Julie, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, so our inspection for the annual fracture critical inspection took place July 13th through the 24th. And as is our practice, uh, we alternate consultants to do the inspection uh, every year. So this year it was Parsons turn to, to perform the inspection. They were on site with uh, eight inspectors this year. Also on site was the MDOT and the Blue Water Bridge snoopers. Um, they come, well, actually MDOT usually comes every year, uh, and, and this year we added the Blue Water Bridge Snooper as well, but it's just really nice to have them on site uh, helping us to reach the um, hard to get to places, uh, especially with our gusset plates and different things that they need to inspect. So we thank them for uh, assisting us this year in our inspection. A couple things to note, um, we'll be doing a, a full depth concrete deck repair this fall. Uh, this area that we're going to be repairing 
actually kind of showed itself last winter and we kind of put a little bit of a, of a band-aid patch on it to get us through um, the summer as well and uh, so this this repair we went out and looked at it and during the inspection we mapped out the cracking underneath the deck and it seems to be fairly isolated to the a small section uh, on a northbound lane north of the anchor pier the north anchor pier and uh, it's it's going to be about a 14 foot by seven foot full depth patch repair that we're putting in and uh, it's in the outside lane northbound so we are working on yet on that yet this fall also um uh, next slide melissa i'll talk about the grading replacement uh, that kim referred to so uh during the inspection which by the way uh, every year we inspect all 170 or 752 panels of grading and we give them uh, a letter grade and those that are the, the lowest letter grade get replaced and so uh, we had 13 panels that were noted just really in the south side span which is uh, south of the south tower and um, it was kind of concentrated in that one area and as kim mentioned um, that's kind of where seaway the, the painting contractor was and so it was nice um, to work with them to uh, coordinate uh, them vacating the area so we could really hit this hard and uh, we've already replaced 10 sections um, and we're actually probably as we speak lifting out two more so we're well on our way to completing um, this task that needed to be done before the end of the season. Um, so we we really hit it hard and the guys did a really good job just working um, to get this this work done. So I want to um, compliment them as well. And um, and the, basically the, the results of the uh, inspection, the annual inspection were pretty typical other than a few things I've mentioned here. Um, they, uh, we saw our normal reporting for all of our general routine maintenance. So um, there wasn't much beyond that, no surprises. So um, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll see if I can answer them. Julie, this is uh, Amy Trahey and I did have a question. Uh, it sounds like uh, the MBA staff themselves, the maintenance uh, team is doing the, the grading replacements. Are they also going to be doing that full depth concrete patch? Yes, actually they will. They will. Um, okay. It's actually two different crews. Um, we have a grading crew that, you know, does specialize in that area. And then fortunately, um, the concrete crews um, are different, different crews. So we'll be able to accomplish both of those tasks this fall um, with their own in-house maintenance. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions of Julie? If not, uh, Julie, we'll keep you front and center. Uh, it's always good to hear from our chief engineer at item six, uh, the deck study informational. Okay. Julie, proceed. Yep. All right. Um, so the last time we spoke about the deck study, uh, that was in March of 2020 at the board meeting down in Grand Rapids. And at that time we had just uh, advertised our request for proposals to uh, see who would like to perform the deck study for us. So since then we had we received four proposals um, from very well qualified uh, consultants. It was a kind of a tough decision to finally pick um, this consultant we selected, which was Parsons. And we had a five member panel that was uh, used to make that selection. And since, since then, uh, Parsons and the Mackinac Bridge staff have gotten together and fine tune our scope of work. Uh, we also negotiated a, a cost of uh, 2.4 million, which um, is um, under budget. So that's good news. And the uh, project was uh, started in July of 2020 with a field inspection, which was in conjunction actually with the annual inspection. So it benefited not only us, but Parsons as well to put those two inspections together. Um, we now have a plan of attack and a schedule for the remaining work. Um, they're currently working on a, a new load rating um, for, for the bridge. Um, 
we are um, actually out there today. We're taking some cores of the deck and uh, we're going to use those to determine the remaining service life of the bridge. Um, they're also diving right in. They're, they're studying uh, the feas feasible alternatives for rehabilitation and replacement at this point, um, which of course will be ongoing. And um, they'll be developing a 3D computer model and wind tunnel testing as well. And I'll speak a little bit about the wind tunnel testing. Um, what they'll do is once we determine our preferred alternatives for the type of deck that they would recommend we replace our existing deck with, we will build or they will build models of um, the deck alternatives and they will put them in a wind tunnel and subject them to various wind loads to determine how they react. And uh, these wind tunnels are in high demand. Uh, they run 24 hours a day in most cases and and the Mackinac Ridge uh, models won't be able to uh, get into the wind tunnel, which the one the wind tunnel we're using would be in, in Ontario, Canada. And uh, so we're planning on starting that process in early February and it won't be completed until mid March. And so after that point, uh, the report will be written and we'll get a chance to review that draft and make comments. And then finally, um, in July of 2021, the consultant will make a presentation to the Mackinac Bridge Authority uh, at their meeting in July uh, with the results of the study. And we're you know, really looking forward, of course, to, to looking at where these major projects are going to land uh, based on this study and so we can uh, fit them into our 20-year plan of, of uh, expenditures. Um, so with that, are there any questions? Julie, this is Bill Milliken. The, uh, the deck study talks about it performing a new load rating for the bridge. Could you describe, is it, could we expect it to go up or down? What is it? Um, I don't expect it'll change much. It's basically um, various loads in different truck configurations that come across the bridge, a, a wide, huge variety. And uh, basically the state of Michigan is a axle loading state. So they will determine and give us models to use that we can then look at various trucks that want to cross and either allow them to cross based on their axle loads or or deny them um, crossing because of their axle loads being too heavy. So we, we do have a current load rating right now that we're using there and what Parsons will do is update that rating um, so we can uh, continue to use um, allowable axle loads to determine who can cross the bridge and who can't. Thank you. One other question. Deck alternatives, uh, are, are alternatives technology driven or what's the range of alternatives that might be in front of us? Well, um, you know, there, there are types of decks that are being developed um, periodically based on technology, yes. And um, but there's also uh, other decks out there that have have been out for a while that have proven themselves. And so they will actually look at other bridges that are similar to the Mackinac Bridge and uh, look at the types of decks that they've been using and then how well they've been working, uh, what isn't working on some of the other decks that are similar to a bridge like the Mackinac Bridge. So they'll do that study as well. And um, I would say that you know, as far as the number of types of decks they might recommend would be probably two to three. Um, and uh, they will they will come up with a preferred alternative uh, and make a recommendation to us on which of those that they they would like to see and, and the reasons why they would like to see that for the Mackinac Bridge. Sounds good, thank you. Any other questions of Julie? Of course, I do because I'm just I'm very excited to see this deck study um, continue, and and of course for the presentation in July of 2021. Um, the the aspect about the replacement options, I like the word rehabilitation as well because we have a five mile long structure, so that's five miles of bridge deck, and let's just say three miles of it is in pretty good condition. So then we could maybe focus on addressing portions of the bridge instead of the entire structure? Yes, that's correct. So um, they will they will analyze the suspended span 
separate from the trust bands. And, and when I say trust bands, they will, you know, we have the South Approach Trust and the North Approach Trust, and each one of those will be even um, analyzed uh, separately from the other. So, um, and then we have our Viadex band. So we have, we have a lot of different uh, types of bridge deck out there, and um, each will have its own uh, place in our future as far as replacement. So they will definitely um, put the projects where they, they'll separate them out essentially and put them where they are, um, where they need to go. And they will look at the rehabilitation as well to determine if, you know, instead of replacing the bridge deck, maybe rehabilitation would be an option to extend its life. Great, I like to hear that. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Any other questions of Julie? I, I do have a brief comment, if I may. Uh, Julie, first of all, let, let me just start by saying an excellent report on both items again, and certainly uh, kudos to all the staff and the maintenance programs that have done a great job uh, keeping up with the schedules and maintaining the bridge. Uh, I'd just like to remind uh, everyone that we do have a deck committee uh, in place that uh, as this progresses, Julie, if if you would keep them up to speed and certainly have them uh, the or have so that they have the opportunity to make a recommendation uh, along with your recommendation to the full board in July on how to proceed with that. I will, and actually, I I so along those lines, uh, what would you like to see from staff as far as reporting? Would you like to see? For example, maybe a, uh, an email update every couple months. Um, would you like to see a, a, a meeting? Um, how would you like me to keep you updated with the progress? Well, I think uh, emails to the full board would certainly be helpful, uh, but especially a, a, a continued dialogue with the chair of the committee, which is member Steidel, on the progress and the inner workings of of the study as it unfolds. I think it'd be a nice gesture for everybody and we always wanna make sure that everybody's uh, included and well aware of what's going on. Thank you. Okay. I hate to interrupt. I do have one more question, Julie, that I think um, it came up in the finance committee inappropriately because of me. <laughs> but we had uh, made an adjustment to the 2020 budget that removed some decorating material that was allocated. So I, my question is, do you still need that? Or it sounds like you had some uh, badly graded sections that you needed to replace kind of quickly after an inspection. I just, I, I'm curious to know like what your inventory is and if you feel that's sufficient for any possible scenario that might happen over the winter. Um, the inventory that we'll be left with at the end of the season will be sufficient to get us through the winter. It, you know, if, if there's something that which were to arise in the middle of the winter that we needed to uh, take care of right away. So that our, our stock will get us to the winter, but next spring, when we go to replace more grading, we will need to order more to supplement our, our stock. And so um, Cole and I uh, plan on uh, very soon uh, starting to get, get uh, bids out for um, the fabrication of more grading for our stock. Okay, awesome. Thank you for staying on top of it. It's, those are probably, you can't just call Amazon and order those, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's quite a leak time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Julie. You're welcome. Any other questions of Julie? If not, we'll move right on to item number seven uh, from, it will be a presentation by our CFO, Cami, in reference to the soft work, toll software update. Cami, good morning. Good morning. Um, our system acceptance testing was completed on May 31st, and um, our SAT punch list was completed on August 28th. Apart from those, uh, those items that um, are either ongoing or their MBA responsibility, um, such as the iOS mobile app, the service organization control audit, and the escrow deposit. The SAP punch list included items such as the Power BI, which you got to see a couple of those reports already, um, 
the financial report edits that um, either myself or Carrie or um, people wanted changes so they were more readable. Our NSF chargeback update for release, our website updates, and our website announcements. Our iOS mobile app um, is a work in progress with, with um, myself at, trying to create an Apple developer account using an MBA specific address email address. And once that is accomplished, um, we turn it over to IBI and they create that iOS um, mobile app for us. A service organization control audit is getting started where we have our auditor input and the IBI auditors and we're trying to correspond those parameters and those control objectives. That is um, a requirement for not only our financial audit but um, also with the contract with IBI. Our um, source code escrow account with IBI is contracted through Iron Mountain Intellectual Property Management. This is an agreement which facilitates the creation, management, and enforcement of the software or technology information needed to be retained for MBA and actually is in control of a storage in, in, in a controlled storage environment. Um, this is all of the technologies that in, involve our toll software are basically put in a um, storage bank for our, our purpose, our need at any given time. So next slide. Um, our maintenance support phase um, started September 10th, which means um, we are out of the implementation and testing phase. And we are now working on the maintenance, the inventory, and just bettering the overall toll system. Um, we work very closely with IBI and they are still on call 24 seven for any of our concerns or needs. Next. MacPass tags versus MacPass cards. Our MacPass tags are at 12.8% of our payment method where MacPass cards are at 11.8%. Cash is at 53.8% and credit debit cards are at 21.6%. So our tags have now um, passed our MacPass cards, um, which is a good thing. We're getting there. So next slide. Um, please be aware these are the Power BI um, reports. They are not printable reports and they do have some um, errors in spelling still. Um, for instance, um, checks are spelt C-H-E-Q-U-E-S and we are in the process of correcting those um, minor errors that we are um, experiencing with the Power BI reports at this point. They are not, uh, again, they are not printable so um, when you see my whole computer screen on there, it is basically a snippet from my computer screen, but they are um, very valuable um, reports that I think give a little bit more of a graphic um, visual of where we are and what we're doing with our traffic. So the second graph is a line graph that shows the correlation between cash, which is the green line, and um, credit cards, which is the black line, you can see during our April, May um, no cash period, the black line is much higher than the green line when cash was not accepted. Quite the opposite during the January, February, March. And um, after um, cash was then accepted again um, in June, July and August where cash um, is far greater than our credit cards. Also the same correlation is um, happens with our MacPass tags versus our MacPass cards. MacPass tags are the yellow line, which is much lower in January, than the MacPass cards, which is the pink line, versus August, which is the exact opposite, where uh, MacPass tags are higher than the MacPass cards. Next slide. The deadline for converting our MacPass cards to MacPass tags is December 31st, 2020. Uh, MacPass cards will be eliminated on January 1st. 
Um, we have done several public relations reminding of this deadline. We have also added reminders to our monthly statements as a little blurb at the bottom that the MAC pass cards are expiring as of December 31st. And I would like to thank um, several staff members, Dan, Carrie, Cheryl, Melissa, and Bridge Services for assisting all of the questions and concerns that our customers have on a daily basis in either um, converting our cards to tags or setting up new accounts. Next slide. And this is the last slide. This is also a Power IBI uh, or a Power BI report, but this just shows when we um, started our new tool software in September, we had converted approximately 25,000 um, accounts over, and we are now at 31,757 accounts as of, I believe it was um, the 28th, and um, we have created 6,715 new accounts in our new tool software. Any questions? I have a question. Um, so living in the area, there have been traffic backups this year, um, like I've never seen before, but there were several years I didn't live in the area. But the traffic backup seemed to be worse this year and traffic has been down. And I'm just wondering if that's something that uh, the bridge is looking at and if there are plans or any ways to alleviate that. We are looking into um, ways to alleviate that, um, but um, we get a lot of questions on why MAC Pass lanes aren't open, and um, any lane that we have is a MAC Pass lane, so you can go through it without having to stop. Um, but we are looking into it. We're we are trying to figure out why the backups are so severe at this point. So, so. Do you have any idea why it why the traffic is backed up more than usual? Go ahead, Kim. Um, yeah, um, Caroline, I'm not sure if you were around um, back when our traffic when I first started at the bridge in 2002. Actually, in some of those early years, we always had Friday backups well into Mackinac City and Sunday backups well out on US2. And it's just a function of how many lanes we can have open and what the traffic is. Um, as we switch over to more stickers, those are the quickest way to get through the toll booths. So um, as our card holders um, make the switch to stickers, they will be improving. Um, that is the quickest way. The next quickest way is uh, cash. So you'll see that uh, our next highest um, amount of payment there, we have a lot of cash users. So um, we have put out press releases and Twitter notices to the public to remind them to avoid those heavy traffic hours. We know exactly what hours of the day and what days of the week they will be. So we're trying to do a public outreach to let people know to avoid those hours. Um, uh, sometimes I will let you know that sometimes like last Sunday, one of our toll booths was not functioning. So it was down for the day and that eliminated a whole lane of traffic that we could not process going southbound. So we work hard to make sure that the booths are, are um, operating. And we also look at those traffic counts just to create the staffing that we need for um, all those booths to make sure that we have enough staffing. So sometimes we have every booth open in both directions and we still um, have backups, but um, we are looking at ways to perhaps use our emergency lanes for Mac Pass use during heavy traffic. And those are in the very preliminary stages, but um, yeah, we're looking at ways uh, to add a little bit more throughput in our toll plaza. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I maybe, this is Trisha Kinley, also kind of uh, uh, add on a question to that because I've noticed it just following it remotely as well. And it sounds like you're doing a great job in terms of the press releases about 
the transition from the cards to the tags. And this may go without saying, but when you look at the cash being, you know, 53 plus percent, would it make sense to kind of do an, a big push about encouraging people to get the sticker and get off of cash? I mean, and that may just kind of be part and parcel, but I have wondered what Caroline has wondered as well. And it just seems like if there's any way to just keep pushing and pushing people, and they may be just tourists going and they don't want to have the trouble of a sticker or a card because they're only going up once or twice a year. But if there's a way to kind of uh, really promote that that cash is so less yesterday or something like that. Just a thought. Yeah, and um, I, I think Cammie might have mentioned how many new accounts we have, and those would be people that necessarily aren't local um, commuter type traffic. So there are a lot of those. Um, we can also, I think, create uh, some information about the use of our MAC pass and how many people are getting the commuter account, which means they're going back and forth within 36 hours, and how many are just using it as a as a debit account. Um, we do have a lot of those customers that do that. They don't get the uh, they don't get the discount because they're not that frequent, but they like the convenience of it. <clears throat> so, so cash transaction is takes about 11 seconds if I remember right and um, which is very very quick especially if you have the exact amount of cash so it's almost as quick as as coming to the rolling stop with your Mac pass and having the gate open so um, we if we had our choice we'd rather see the the cash than the credit card which is quite a bit slower transaction uh, okay <laughs> thank you for that clarification and understand too, those 6,715 new accounts, um, you know, there might be two, three, four vehicles for each account. So that doesn't mean tags, that just means accounts. And um, we have some commercial accounts that have 400 vehicle, vehicles on it. So um, each account is multiple tags, most, most multiple tags, so. Thank you, Cammy. Is there any other questions or concerns uh, under Cammy's report? Hearing none, we'll move right ahead with the bridge cable special lighting. This is an informational report from our assistant engineer, Cole, and our executive secretary, Kim. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman, and <clears throat> good morning. Um, so at the last board meeting in uh, July, I gave a presentation on advances in bridge lighting and specifically gave some examples of changeable lighting systems that are out there throughout the country. And based on that presentation and discussions with the board, it was voted for me to delve a little bit deeper into this and how we might be able to get it done at the Mackinac Bridge with some basic criteria. Um, essentially, we didn't want to add a whole lot of light to the area and we didn't want to change the look of the bridge at all. So with that in mind, I kind of set out to see what kind of options we had. Um, and we want to be able to do it remotely so that we don't have to send employees like pictured uh, out to change the lights um, and we can do it kind of from the comfort of our offices and things like that. So with that in mind, um, next slide please. There are some challenges that we face in terms of getting this done at the Mackinac Bridge. Changeable lighting in general is a pretty new technology. The way it works is the light bulbs themselves have multiple light sources and those light sources blend in different levels to create the different look and, and color of the lights themselves. So right off the bat, these, these bulbs are more complicated than your standard single source white light bulb. And in order to change and to do so remotely, they also require communication with themselves and some sort of controller that tells them what colors to be. And requiring that communication, they are also located in, in an isolated solution. The cable lights are not only suspended up in the air on the cables, but the cables don't even begin for over a mile from either 
shoreline. So to get that communication out there is is an obstacle we face. And also any system we put into place has to withstand the harsh conditions that the bridge goes through, whether it be strong winds or ice. So these are some challenges we face uh, when I was looking into this. Um, next slide, please. So the biggest thing we need is to get communication out on the bridge in order to do this. And there's basically two options. You can do a hardwired system or you can do a wireless system. Our current cables that run power out to the lights do not have the ability to transmit data. So a hardwired system would almost be like restarting. Uh, next slide, please. But there are advantages to a hardwired system. As anyone who uses Wi-Fi, it's typically more reliable when you're wired in. Um, Wi-Fi can go in and out. It has more chance to. So getting new lines and running them out there would allow us to have a more reliable and sturdy system. We could also use it as a reason to upgrade the existing power lines. If we're running new lines out there anyway to get data out there, why not upgrade them? But as I mentioned in the last presentation, our current system is in pretty good shape and has quite a bit of life left in it. So it is a benefit that we could try to maybe upgrade the lines, but it's not necessarily required at this time. Um, another advantage of a, a wired system is since all the lights are connected physically that it is just more reliable and you can have more complicated systems. Um, most of the different options for changeable light that I found did require a hardwired system. So by having that, it would open up our options of what kind of lights we could get. Uh, the disadvantage is cost. Um, by running out new lines, that's just a lot new, a lot more labor. Uh, just putting in any kind of new infrastructure is just adds up the cost, especially running it from shore out to the bridge and back, which we'd almost require a loop from shore out to the bridge and back. So it'd be quite a large amount of material and things that we'd have to get installed. So, and then lastly, one of the criteria I was trying to do was keep the look of the bridge as close to existing as possible. And the problem in general with colored light is it's not as bright as white light. So in my research and some of the companies I've talked to, they've actually recommended more of a kind of a cluster as pictured of different of several different light fixtures bundled together, which obviously looks quite a bit different than our uh, existing globe light. But from far away, it should it should, although it's made up of multiple, it should look like one single light. So in the day it would look different, but at night it should look like a single light. But with all of this infrastructure required and just a project of this scale, uh, it's estimated that to get it done would cost uh, over a million dollars. So uh, next slide, please. So a way to try to rear in that cost a little bit is trying to do a wireless system just because it would let us utilize our existing power lines because in a wireless system, the, the light bulbs themselves do the communication. You'd have to install different kinds of wireless routers out on the bridge. But then as you can see in this image with the, the red arrow, the light bulbs themselves actually contain little antennas that allow them to communicate. So you kind of eliminate that need to string them all together. And that just is a big cost savings because you don't need as much cable and uh, labor to get it installed. And a company I was, I've been in discussion with uh, called Michigan Lighting Systems, they actually took it upon themselves to get a prototype made. Uh, that's what's actually pictured here uh, to kind of mimic what we have there. So it, it could resemble, uh, it just shows the options out there uh, that it could resemble what we have a little closer than the cluster, cluster uh, that I showed before, but it also just kind of exhibits just what a new technology this is and what a unique kind of project this would be just 
a company that specialized in this had to make a prototype. They didn't have something off the shelf that they could just give us. And um, that's one of the disadvantages is this equipment would probably have to be custom, which of course increases the price. Uh, a wireless system would just be a little bit simpler in its capabilities. And of course, a wireless system is just not as necessarily reliable uh, as far as in a heavy snow will these lights go out that's something we don't want so it is a lot cheaper to try to do a wireless system but it comes with a little bit greater risk um, but it's estimated that a wireless system we could maybe try to get installed for about a third of the price of a, a wired system next slide please so one aspect that I didn't really touch on my last presentation is incorporating changeable lighting into the tower floodlights, um, which has been done in the past. When the Mackinac Bridge participated in the Light It Blue campaign for autism awareness, um, they actually lit the towers blue as well as the cable lights. And that's what's pictured here. But it was a bit of a learning experience in that the blue light just wasn't as bright. So you can see it looks very, very, uh, very cool, the, the blue towers, but it was just a lot dimmer than what you're used to seeing the towers lit up as. So that's something we would also have to solve as we look into this. And I've been told that the, the tower lights could run on the same system as the cable lights. So you could kind of do the tower lights and the cable lights running on the same system and programmed, but you could also do it independently. So you could just do the tower lights or you could just do the cable lights. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, I am a structural engineer. I'm not an electrical engineer. So the options I've kind of presented aren't necessarily the only ones out there. If we move forward with a project and put it out to bid, we may get several other options that I haven't even seen yet. Um, but that said, I have talked to several companies and, and several people who I would consider experts in this field. And the Mackinac Bridge is just a unique structure. As you saw, many of them couldn't really guarantee the efficiency of the systems they were promoting. And they did believe they could get it done, but they just require a little bit more, like a site visit and a deeper look just because it is a long way out there and it is some harsh conditions. So uh, as a staff, we would kind of recommend before moving forward with a project, maybe doing some kind of feasibility study that's a little bit more in depth where we maybe get some of these lights tested. And um, regardless of doing a study, we would recommend that any supplier guarantees uh, their equipment um, and that they test it and ensure its performance and reliability uh, for our needs. And uh, lastly, if we do move forward with a color changing light uh, lighting program, uh, we have some recommendations that it should be kind of laid out well as far as what kind of organizations could uh, choose the lighting themes and uh, what kind of fees we should include. Um, we recommend a fee that would kind of cover the initial cost as well as the annual cost of running the program, including staff time and things. And um, that brings me, I can uh, direct us to our uh, executive secretary who kind of laid out an outline in your packets on how a program like this could run. So uh, Kim, you can go ahead and uh, expand on that. Okay. and. Um I'm going to basically refer you to your packet where I just laid out a very preliminary concept of what a program could look like, um, who might be eligible, and uh, how we might how we might pick the charities and in an efficient way. And and um, we confirmed with Kathleen Gleason about the fees we could charge to recoup our costs. So that's one good thing. So I'm not going to read all that to you since it's all in your packet and it's just a just a very preliminary idea about how it might be done. Um, I will say, Cole, great idea, great um, presentation, um, 
we did have trouble with the blue light globes for our autism event that were very hard to see from shore. And that's with our bright white light with a blue globe in it. So um, we all have big concerns about whether we put these lights out there and you can't see them from shore since it's so far away. So um, that's a big concern of ours. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, um, thank you, Kim. Uh, so yeah, so that said, any questions? Cool, this is Bill Milliken. In your opening remarks, you uh, talked about the manpower requirements for changing out the lights that we have in place now. What's the useful life of the bulbs that are in place or the elements, the lighting elements? So um, throughout the last uh, several years, they, the, the cable lights have been being swapped out with LED lights, which do just have uh, a lot longer life. And talking with uh, our staff and our electrician, we probably have just a few of them go out each year. So when one of them goes out, they go out and replace it. But um, they all are actually LED now. And um, that LED lights just do have a lot longer life. So that should be reduced slightly to uh, just a couple of year that need to be replaced. So as of right now, the the labor as far as changing the lights, since we are only changing them as they go out, isn't very high, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I can uh, make a comment. First, I want to say uh, thank you to Cole and uh, Kim and her staff for all the hard work they've done to, to get us this far. I, I thought uh, it's a very good presentation. Um, I, I agree with the, the second and fourth bullet on, on the screen. I, I think he's done as great a job as can be expected up to this point that perhaps if it pleases the rest of the board, maybe we'll make a, I'll be more than happy to make a motion that we hire a consultant to do a feasibility study. Um, part of that study will get more in-depth into this and look at some of the things that he mentioned about uh, being able to see it from shore and all the other challenges that may come with this. I think that that, that study will be able to flush it out. And I also agree that uh, with Kim's comment that perhaps uh, if we can set up a, a, a some kind of a policy on how we charge people for this, maybe over time we'll be able to recoup this money back. So I, I strongly think this is an endeavor worth pursuing and see uh, how far we go. But thank you, Cole, and uh, Kim, for all the hard work you put into this. Uh, thank you. I have a question. What? What? Why do we want to do this in the first place? What? What's the upside to this expenditure? We just took money out of our budget the last meeting. I've only been to two meetings, but the bridge is beautiful the way it is, and I don't really understand if the lighting is still good, why we would spend any more money on it. Well, if I may comment on that, for me, when I go to a lot of big cities that has this kind of iconic bridges, you see this kind of light displays. It, it's more like the, the backdrop of that of that city. And I think uh, for all the requests we get from different organizations to want to promote uh, autism or whatever that 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 issue is, I think being able to, to be part of that, it, it's, it, it, it's a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, again, if we can set up a policy where we recoup our costs over time, I think it'd be well worth it. We have these light displays on our Blue Water Bridge in uh, Port Huron. And it, it, I, I, I think it's, it's a good, good, good thing. But we are not in a city. We're, we're, our bridge goes from trees to trees, and we get a few people here in the summer. And I find it difficult to believe that anyone else is going to become any more aware of anything because our lights are turned blue or pink. And it just seems a little bit fiscally irresponsible at this time when we've cut our budget at the last meeting for something that I don't I don't see a big upside to. 
This is Bill Milliken. I, I got a concern about the nonprofit aspect of this that I read about in my packet. And we are a public agency and attempting to jury requests for um, from nonprofits for display on the bridge, I think is opening Pandora's box. I think that um, in this era of social media and, and vocal nonprofits, um, there are some organizations that we would not want to associate with. And if they were at our door, I'm not sure how we could decline to take their money or to put their light colors up or accommodate whatever their requests are. So I'm concerned about evaluating and trying to implement any program like that without getting us in, in deep conflict. If I may address that, um, and th that's a very good point. Uh, th that's the danger of something like this. When I was on the uh, Ann Arbor Transit Board, for the history of that uh, transit agency, they've never done advertising on the buses before. But they needed to generate some uh, revenues. And we, as a board, uh, decided, OK, what about we start advertising on buses? And exactly some of the issues you mentioned was what we had to confront. And that's where putting a policy in place uh, comes in, where the board de decides going in, what are the parameters are we going to use to determine you know, how we do this. Um, in the case of the Annabelle Transit Agency, we had to say no anti-Semitic uh, messages and uh, advertising and on and on and on. So we were able to eliminate a lot of things that could create uh, a lot of controversy or offend anybody, any of the bus riders. So I, I think that, that kind of issue could be addressed by uh, you know, working on a, a policy way up front, but that's a long way. Uh, we still have a lot of time to get there if the board agrees that we should at least do a feasibility study and, and look at this possibility. Again, I, I understand the cost issue, but if it, it's shown that we can recoup our costs back over a period of time, I, I think it's, it's well worth at least taking a look at. That's what feasibility study is, looking at it. So co-chair Trey here, I'm, I'm torn because of the fiscal responsibility that you brought up, Carolyn. Thank you for that. And also um, the potential meaning that it would have to light it up. My son is autistic and we bought a bulb, a blue bulb. And every time we go over the bridge, I'm like, there's your bulb buddy. And it makes him feel so special that he's kind of being acknowledged. So um, Director Ajiba has a lot more experience with this and I, I trust his judgment to potentially do this feasibility study. The timing of that right now fiscally doesn't align with the pandemic um, and, and some of the tough decisions we have. So is it possible to just kind of hit pause on the feasibility study, maybe for a year till, till we see how we're feeling financially and, and if our revenues are kind of leveling off as a compromise? I, I, I will support that. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I. I think the, the staff's done a lot of good work here. Uh, we can kind of hold off till our financial situation looks better. Um, perhaps while we're holding off, it would be nice to know what, how much would it even cost to do a feasibility study? Somebody has a lawnmower going in the background. Um, yeah, that's that's my yacht. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to mention that perhaps while we're waiting to do something more official, Cole can talk to his contact who created that nice uh, prototype and they could give it to us to play with and we could see if we can even see it from shore. So, so, so we could pursue something like that in the meantime. Um, uh, it might be, you know, something to keep the ball in play. Yeah, that's that's something I can... I can do uh, with some of the contacts I've established um, even before we get to that feasibility study portion, just kind of maybe try to get some of these lights and even just test them out as much as we can ourselves while, while we kind of put this on pause. I, uh, Are there any other? I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I'm sorry, this is Trisha Kinley. And maybe as part of that, if the Blue Water Bridge is doing this, could we also just tap their experience of evaluating? I, I share everyone's concerns kind of all uh, already brought up, but maybe just in terms of still doing our homework, they have a policy in place. What has been their experience with the incoming requests, even just to kind of get a, an understanding of that? The, the pros and cons and pitfalls? Yes, for sure. Um, that can be something that we research, the Blue Water Bridge. And I also put a feeler out to the Gordie Owl, the new Gordie Owl, thinking they must have some new light technology. And I found out they only have um, white lights. So that could change going forward. But for some reason, they only have white lights. So I need to dig a little deeper into that. But yeah, that could be something going forward. Um, through the winter months, we can inquire about Blue Water and the Gordie Howe. Yeah, just I, I'm, I'm particularly also interested in in the the types of requests that come in and what borders on pushing the envelope where we're not comfortable. Because I have some of those concerns too. There's so many very merit worthy uh, charities, but you know my my merit worthy charity may not be be somebody else's or. Uh, you know, acceptable. Yeah, and I will say that um, this is mostly a brand new board from 2015, but we had these many of these same discussions back in 2015, and that's why we chose to not do not change the lights for charities. Well, because it was it was hugely labor intensive, um, and uh, we didn't want to be stuck picking the others. But with Director Ajiba's ideas about setting up policies, I mean, sounds like it could it could be done. Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, first of all, let me just say this, Cole, Kim, excellent report. Uh, what I like about reports of this nature is good, thorough discussion, and it certainly uh, is something that uh, we're going to look at in the future. I think the recommendation coming from our vice chair Trey in reference to uh, taking a, a step back here for a while, looking at it. I uh, certainly, I believe everybody shares the concerns from member Cheeseman in reference to the financial situation the bridge is in. And I think Woody uh, has done a good job on not being able to predict of where we're going to be with this virus. I think that's reinforced as well with Cami's presentation with the one in 10% reductions that we may be faced with in the next year. But I think it's a that's worth discussing in the future. In the meantime, we can hear from Cole and see what uh, he can add from the Blue Water Bridge as member uh, Kenley uh, recommended. So I, I would hope that we could keep this conduct, cons or excuse me, keep this conversation going in the future and we'll see what, uh, where, where it leads us. So if there's no further, uh, comment, we'll move on to item nine. And once again, Cole, Kim, thank you for a very thorough presentation. Uh, if everybody's comfortable, we'll move to item nine on their old business line five, Tunnel update, and our executive secretary Kim, as well as our legal counsel Kathleen, will uh, give us a update on the Line Five type tunnel. Okay, um, thank you. This picture that I chose for the slide is just a screenshot from the Michigan.gov/Line Five website that um, uh, tells us all things related to Line Five. And this picture here, I'll just let you know that. Line five is actually in the picture. Sometimes they just show the Mackinac Bridge with no line five. But if you were to be able to look underwater uh, behind the wake of this uh, ferry or this uh, freighter going through over to the uh, west of the bridge, that's where line five is a couple miles over to the west of the bridge running parallel. So definitely not under the bridge or attached to the bridge in any sh way, shape or form. Um, the little snippets in your packet, the little summaries of, of different topics related to line five were all taken from this michigan.gov line five website. And so we included those in your packet just to get a very brief 
um, look at some things that have happened related to line five, and then I will turn it over to our attorney general um, counsel, uh, Kathleen Gleason, to give you the bigger um, summary picture of line five. Okay, thank you, Kim. Good morning, everybody. Um, this handout that's in the pack is actually really pretty um, well done. I read it um, when Kim had suggested putting it in here. And it, if you're wondering how we got from 1953 to now with this line five situation, this is a really good explanation. What I'm going to focus on in just a few minutes, I mean, I don't have a few minutes is all I'm going to speak here. Um, I want to talk about the legal aspect of what has happened and what is happening with line five. Um, where this stands legally right now is that there have been three primary challenges to this tunnel by Enbridge going in. So far, um, the tunnel is still going forward. None of the challenges have been successful. Um, just for a bit of background, because we do have new people on the board, I wanted to give you a little bit, you know, information about legally how this corridor authority came about and what has happened since 2018. Um, things started legally. They probably started quite a ways before then, but when it became more in the public eye and legislation actually um, was passed was when Governor Snyder was leaving office at the end of 2018. He signed legislation that created the Mich or the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority. That authority is a board of three people who were appointed. Um, the Mackinac Bridge Authority has nothing to do with the Corridor Authority, but the Corridor Authority's um, was the legislation that deals with that authority was placed in the same act that authorizes um, the activities by this authority, the Mackinac Bridge Authority. Um, the, the Corridor Authority is supposed to report to this board once a year about its activities. That hasn't happened yet, but it probably will because that board was shut down for a while. Um, the Corridor Authority does operate completely independently of the MBA. Um, and the only link it has to MDOT is that MDOT is supposed to support it. Well, not supposed to, but it does by statute. It helps with the administrative functions that the corridor authority has. So when things like FOIA requests come in or um, the corridor authority needs to engage in a contracting process, it can use MDOT's um, processes. So as you probably know from the news, um, and most of the state knows this, the corridor authority is, the, the job of that authority is to build this tunnel connecting the two peninsulas. All of the costs are borne by a private party. In this case, that is Enbridge, that is paying 100% of the costs for the design, the construction, the operation, the maintenance of the tunnel. But then once the tunnel is completed, Enbridge is gonna turn ownership of that over to the corridor authority which will lease space within that tunnel to different utilities. Um, I believe the geotechnical work is either completely done or mostly done on the tunnel. Um, and as I said at the beginning of this, there have been three legal challenges. The first legal challenge came about when the governor and the current governor and the current attorney general took over uh, their offices in January of 2019 the AG issued an opinion that the legislation that created the Corridor Authority was unconstitutional. The governor then seeing that opinion uh, prohibited the state from taking any further action um, in creating this tunnel. Uh, the governor did try to negotiate uh, for the next few months with Enbridge to try to get the time for completion of the tunnel down to about two years Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, the lawsuit then went forward and, uh, well, actually I didn't talk about a lawsuit. There was this AG opinion and that opinion was out there. The governor acted on that. Enbridge, when negotiations broke down with the governor, wanted something to be done. It wanted to be able to move forward. So it sued the state 
asking the court to declare that the um, legislation was constitutional. The court agreed with Enbridge on that um, count. It went to the Michigan Court of Appeals. Michigan Court of Appeals agreed with that. And that was just a few months ago in June. And then in July of this year, the attorney general declined to take the case to the Michigan Supreme Court. So for that first legal challenge, there's no question now that the law that established the corridor authority is valid and the agreement with Enbridge stands. So the second uh, legal challenge that has come to this tunnel is still underway. It's been outstanding for a while and it's obviously hard to predict what's going to happen, but not much has happened so far. In that case, the attorney general sued Enbridge um, seeking that it remove the existing pipeline, um, claiming that the 1953 easement, or the easement that allowed the pipeline to be placed in 1953 is not in the public interest. That lawsuit has been languishing. There really is not much um, happening with that, but it could still, um, you know, there something will get resolved with that. It's just a matter of time. As you probably know too from the news, um, there was a brief shutdown this summer um, of from, gosh, both legs of the pipeline. One leg was shut down for a few days. The other was shut down for a month and a half, but it was recently opened, reopened that second leg. So the pipeline is functioning as it has been. Um, the third legal challenge, and this is really the what is where the efforts are being placed right now by lots of different groups is before the Public Service Commission. Uh, before Enbridge can relocate, once its tunnel is done, um, the, the oil and gas that flow through its pipeline, before it can relocate that into its tunnel, it needs permission from the Public Service Commission. And many people are preparing for that um, administrative hearing battle that's going to happen. There will likely likely be an answer. Um, best guess is April of 2021 about what will be um, the result from that. So legally, those are the three challenges. Two of the three are still outstanding, but you know it's hard to predict what's going to happen, but the tunnel construction is still moving forward. So that's the update legally. Any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Are there any questions of Kathleen? Kim, I want to thank you and Kathleen both for the uh, wonderful update on line five, uh, very thorough. And Kathleen, your legal experience is, is always very beneficial to this authority. Thank you. Thank you. If there's if there's no comments or questions, uh, we have a lawsuit that we have to settle in reference to the south side uh, span. And we'll also call on Kim and Kathleen to continue under item number 10. Kim, Kathleen, or I'm sorry, it will, I'm sorry, Kim, go ahead. Yes, um, item number 10 in your book. There's also some more information in your packet about the south side span. And this uh, this uh, lawsuit is almost as uh, old as my career at the Mackinac Bridge because south side span was one of the first jobs I worked on when I got my job in 2002. Um, that contractor uh, failed to complete their warranty work. Uh, that means that they, they did the job. It, we had two years of warranty and it needed some repairs from warranty and they did not come back and do that. So we put them in default and asked their bonding company, their surety to do the warranty repairs and the bonding company refused to do the repairs. So we did those ourselves with the Mackinac Bridge staff and we kept track of time and materials and equipment. And we ended up suing uh, Allstate for uh, a little over a million dollars to recoup our costs to complete the warranty repairs. And then um, lo and behold, not only did Allstate Painting go out of business, but the bonding company surety ended up going out of business and into uh, liquidation. So that brings us uh, closer to where we are today. We filed our claim, I think back in 2008 
or no, I, we filed our claim with the liquidator um, and we've been waiting years uh, to hear something about it. And we heard something um, just recently that is why we're talking about it at this meeting. And Attorney General Representative um, uh, Mike Dittenberg is the one who's handling this lawsuit. So um, Mike is going to uh, tell us about that. All right. Uh, thanks, Kim. Uh, good morning to the board members. As Kim said, uh, I'm Mike Dittenberg for those board members who haven't met me yet. Uh, I work under Kathleen, who is, as of this week, our new division chief in the transportation division. Oh. And uh, Kim summed up uh, the history of this very well. As she indicated, this has been going on for quite some time. Uh, when I was doing going through the timeline, I was actually a freshman in undergrad when we signed this contract. So. <laughs> And then now we're here. Um, Michigan has a rule, a statute that if a insurance company goes into liquidation as Amico did here, that it, the state defers to the proceedings in the other state where the company is located. So that's why we're in this Illinois proceeding. Uh, we filed our claim in the liquidation proceeding in 2015. Uh, they extended the claim deadline several times, so that's why it's taken so long to get to this point. In 2019, the liquidator actually denied the claim in full or, or disallowed it under their terminology. It was a form letter. It didn't get into the details of why it was disallowed. Um, our office filed an appeal of that, and this summer I was contacted by the liquidator uh, with a proposal under which the MBA would agree to the value of the claim at $500,000 in exchange for the claim being allowed and essentially getting in line for any uh, disbursements that are going to be available. Uh, the original uh, value of the MBA's work that it performed was a little over a million dollars. The default judgment was uh, just under $1.2 million, and that's because of interest and court costs that were added in on top of the uh, the work amount. Um, my recommendation is that the board uh, accept the, the proposal to move forward with the claim valuation of $500,000. Otherwise, uh, if the board denies this, there would likely be some type of administrative proceeding in Illinois where uh, myself, Kim, possibly other MBA members would have to go testify. It's possible that the liquidator could still outright disallow the claim or allow it in some uh, number lower than the default judgment of 1.2 million or even lower than the uh, proposed uh, stipulation of $500,000. The liquidator was unable to estimate uh, what proceeds might be available. That is, you know, what percentage of that $500,000 value the MBA might realize. Uh, I would expect it would be a fraction of that amount and it's going to be a fraction of the amount whether uh, the MBA accepts this proposal or if it were able to uh, submit the claim in a higher amount. And the liquidators also strongly recommended that the MBA accept this to move the process along. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has about the process or how we got to this point. And otherwise I would recommend that the board vote to accept the proposal. This is Vice Chair Trahey. I, I mean, I hate the precedent it sets because we work with contractors all the time at the authority, especially painting contractors, right? So, you know, the, the easy out is to just drag it out years, go out of business, and, and then your, your, uh, you know, your debt is forgiven. I mean, that just, it doesn't rest well with me as far, as far as sending a message to the other contractors that are actively pursuing projects with the authority. Um, but I do understand the timeliness of it all and uh, the drain it's been on uh, administratively across many departments. Um, so I guess I guess I would like to hear some feedback. Maybe um, Director Ajaba or um, Mr. Seidel, if they've been through similar types of uh, litigation, um, your recommendation would would mean a lot. Go ahead, director. No, I, I was going to give you the floor. 
as a as a veteran among us. <laughs> uh, well, Amy, I, that that is uh, a great question, and I agree with you. Uh, it doesn't sit well that uh, it, you know a contractor just drag it out and and uh, you know ultimately you know wait us out and and you know we lose. Um, I also uh, with Kim have been around this particular topic uh, and and with the chairman since it started, and uh, I don't uh, I I don't think our uh, our options are good. I don't think they've ever been really good when we heard the surety went out of business. Um, my recommendation is that we we accept this settlement, uh, put this to bed, and move on. I mean, to, to, to me, this is really a unique circumstance where the contractor went out of business and the surety went out of business, right? We usually have a surety to protect us from that. So, you know, I can't remember a time when both have ever happened before. So I don't think this is likely to be, you know, a continuation because, you know, we'd have to have a, a mass loss of the surety uh, industry as well. Thank you very much for your uh, expressing your opinion and your recommendation. Thank you. Uh, I agree with the director. It's highly, highly unusual. That's why we asked for performance bonds as something to fall back on. And contractor goes out of business or non-performance, we'll go after the bonding company. But in this case, what goes out of business, it's highly unusual. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, right. I would, um, excuse me, uh, Chair Gleason, I, I would second both of those. I don't know that our office has another example of a contractor's surety going into liquidation like this during an active project. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? I agree with Mike on that point. He's been with the office 10 years. I've been here 23 and I haven't seen a situation like this before either. So good. Hopefully we won't anymore. <laughs> seems it's 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 so unfortunate, but it seems like at some point we also have to cut our losses. I mean, continuing to pursue it when the chances of success may not really, you know, get a better result. And we have staff time that have to go to Illinois, legal costs, it just doesn't that it doesn't add up. It's just a horrible I think well put, Amy. It's a horrible precedent. Don't want to let anyone else uh, have this situation. Hopefully. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, this is uh, this is Kirk. Well, I, I wonder if I could make a, make a motion to approve uh, uh, the MBA uh, engaging in the settlement and and settle this. You most certainly can, if that's your question. Yep. I'd like to make that motion. Okay, a motion's been made by Member Stito that the, based on the recommendation from the attorney of approximately $500,000 for our request in this settlement of this lawsuit, a Support is needed before there's any more discussion on the motion. Is there support to the motion? So moved. Okay, it's, it's been moved by Director Stito and supported, excuse me, it's been moved by Member Stito, supported by Director <laughs> Ajabak. Is there a discussion on the motion? I just have one brief comment. Uh, from day one, I have been involved in this, and I certainly know the time and the energy. Uh, Bob Sweeney, Kim Nowak, all of his staff members, our previous attorneys on the MBA, and it's been a uphill struggle forever. And I'd just like to add with 45 years in the construction industry, I've seen a lot of bankruptcies and I've certainly seen a lot of lawsuits. I have never ever seen where a contractor goes bankrupt and a surety company goes bankrupt as well. Uh, it's just, uh, it's something that I'm sure we'll never see again, but it's literally impossible to have a scenario like this in, in normal course of doing business. So if there, is there any more discussion on the motion? 
Okay, uh, I'll call the question now. Kim, if you would be kind enough to take the roll call on this, please. Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Yes. Director Ajaba? Yes. Member Steidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. And Member Cheeseman? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you very much, uh, Mike and Kim. Uh, it's good to have that behind us. We'll move right on for new business now. We have a uh, action item will be number 11. And before we get into the business of, of that action item, I'd like to ask Kim and Kathleen if they would report, uh, give us an overview of why we're looking at this uh, bylaw review and revisions. Okay, um, this uh, was initiated at our one of our previous meetings. A, a procedural question came up, and uh, Council Gleason uh, asked me, "Well, what do the bylaws say?" And so we got searching for bylaws. And so um, you'll see in your packet our current and most recent bylaws are there in the packet, and then um, also in the packet is something that Council Gleason uh, made us aware of is. Um, some recently amended bylaws from Michigan Aeronautics Commission, which are in a similar format to uh, the Bridge Authority uh, bylaws, so could be used. So um, the the task at hand is to decide whether to kick off a bylaw committee review of of the bylaws. So, uh, Council Gleason, perhaps you have more to add about the procedure or um, words of wisdom. Yeah, I can add a little bit and a little more about how this came up. Kim is right. It came up right before the meeting that we were going to have or that we had about the bridge walk. And there were questions. It was the first virtual meeting that this board had. And there were questions about when the public wants to comment, you know, how long can people speak, how many people can speak, you know, how long can we limit to maybe an hour of comments, those kind of questions. Those are typically handled by bylaws. And Kim and I realized that these bylaws that we do have, they're not very helpful. <laughs> they're they're very old. Um, they address none of the concerns that we had. So I talked to an attorney named Tom Quas around now. He's the AG's FOIA and open meetings at Guru. He knows everything about this. His recommendation was the board needs bylaws. That this is <laughs> how we solve this problem. Um, so then I started looking into, into the procedure of how we would get bylaws. And we can't, because there are already some here, we can amend, you can amend what has been done. Um, let me see. The safest thing to do would be after there's discussion about whether you think the bylaws should be amended, make a motion. And if it carries, then the bylaws committee would start drafting and working on some amendments to these bylaws. Once those are done, it would notify the board of what it recommends. The board would look at them, discuss them. If it agrees that they should be approved, the board would approve them. And then we would take them to the state ad board and it would approve them. At that point, we have valid bylaws that would address some of these situations that we haven't had good answers to. So I definitely recommend that we go through this process. And I would obviously help the committee and you know answer questions to the board about this. Thank you. Before I go any further, before we go any further, I'd just like to remind everybody that we have a bylaws committee in place now that consists of two members. The chair of that committee is uh, Member Cheeseman. Uh, I hope that you agree that it's time to revisit the bylaws, and I would strongly su suggest to the board, you being first, that we reinstate the bylaw committee with the sole purpose of taking on this challenge to report back to the board. Caroline? I agree. It, we obviously need to update, and I never dreamed I would have to do something so quickly, <laughs> but so be it. Um, I agree we should take it on and 
review? Well, I would like to recommend that you make a motion and uh, for to proceed with it and we'll okay, see I what make a motion that we proceed with reviewing and updating the bylaws if necessary. Thank you. Is there support to that motion? I'll support the motion, Bill. Thank you. A motion's been made, supported, that we reinstate the bylaws committee for the purpose of reviewing and updating the bylaws of the Mackinac Bridge Authority. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, our executive secretary, Kim, would you be kind enough to call roll, please? Yes, I'll do that. Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahi? Yes. Director Ajaba? Yes. Member Steidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. And Member Cheeseman? Yes. Thank you, Kim. Motion carried. Uh, Caroline, thank you. I look forward to working with you and thank you for taking on this task. Thank you. We have a uh, report from the chair of the Finance Committee, uh, Member Chair Trahey, in reference to the action need uh, from the Finance Committee meeting this morning. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you all the other members who attended the Finance Committee, which was, you know, a full house. So I appreciate all the participation and, and your patience to kind of rehear things that you've already heard um, at our Finance Committee meeting that was held this morning at 9 a.m. Um, to recap the, the high points of the meeting, um, both Lon Chen and Woody Tyler of the Michigan Department of Treasury gave an update on the MBA investment portfolio as well as an update, uh, an economic report. Lon indicated that despite the pandemic, as of August, the investment portfolio is at 119 million, up 7.9, mainly due to the varied asset class that the portfolio consists of, as well as the impact of a lower interest rates realized uh, due to appreciation. The economic report by Woody uh, presented it indicated basically that the U.S. economy is in a square root recovery. So for all you math geeks, you're going to love that one. Um, meaning that the trajectory of the recovery will be governed more by the virus than economics. The next six months are predicted to be very uncertain as the southern states work to control outbreaks and the northern states, such as the great state of Michigan, uh, move into peak flu and flu season in late fall and early winter. In 2021, we can anticipate the recovery will pick up momentum as the virus becomes under better control and vaccines are readily available. The next item of business, um, Executive Secretary Kim Nowak gave a pleasantly surprising update regarding the pandemic and the effect of, of the pandemic on the traffic and revenue um, for the bridge. To summarize, um, 2020 fiscal year accumulation um, revenue up to August 31st is down 1.96 million. As the stages of the virus and the gradual reopening of Michigan occurred, the traffic volumes became greater and greater um, up to September, which on audited numbers show that the revenues are actually greater than the previous year prior pandemic. Um, weekend traffic for Michiganders heading to the Upper Peninsula has really helped um, the authority to see rather minor losses in revenue as compared to other tolled bridges, which is very, very positive news. To proactively prepare for the estimated revenue losses due to the pandemic, we passed a budget amendment during our July 2020 meeting that created a cost savings of $3.9 million. So we are prepared to account for the 2020 revenue loss of 1.96 million and still have a budget or cushion available to carry another potential revenue deficit if there is a second wave of COVID. Um, let's see, next, the uh, MBA, the Mackinac Bridge Authority CFO, Cami Hansen, presented the 2020 
uh, fiscal year budget review as well as the 2021 business plan. It's, um, she did a wonderful job because the, the business plan for 2021 also accounted for the decrease of traffic based on the pandemic that outlined the impact if um, a 1% decrease or 5% decrease or 10% decrease of traffic and revenues um, were realized. CAMI also provided the capital outlay expenditures for fiscal year 2021 um, and, and also um, based on a request by member Steitel at the last board meeting, she prioritized that capital outlay expenditure list with some of the more expensive items being reserved for later 2021, which will give the board some flexibility to ebb and flow with the unknowns of the pandemic um, if we need to at our next board meeting. Um, outside of that, it was um, great to see everybody at the finance committee meeting and, and that's that's the report for the for the October 1st meeting. Thank you, Chair Trey. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, a motion was put in order by you to accept the report from the financial committee. Is there support to the motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll support that motion. Thank you. Member Steidel has been moved and supported. Is there any discussion on the motion? Once again, Amy, I'd like to thank you for the very thorough report as well as the reports from the uh, others that were involved in that committee hearing. Uh, excellent, excellent job. Thank you. Yes. Hearing none, I'd like to ask the executive secretary, Kim, to call the roll call on the motion, please. All right, Chairman Gleason. Yes. Vice Chair Trahey. Yes. Director Ajaba. Yes. Member Steidel. Yes. Member Kinley. Yes. Member Milliken. Yes. Member Cheeseman. Yes. Thank you, Kim. Motion carried. Uh, next item under new business, uh, the 2021 meeting schedule. Uh, this was action item. We, our first decision uh, for sure is going to have to be a meeting in February or March of 2021. Kim, do you have any recommendations? Uh, where it should be, number one, and number two, any projected dates, if everybody could kind of look at their calendars uh, quickly and yes. put some places and dates on the table and see what we can come up with. That's right. Um, on the screen here are some dates we came up with, tentative dates, and um, we, staff thought it was time to go back to St. Ignace uh, for a meeting, and so we're proposing the spring meeting be in St. Ignace and uh, try again for the fall meeting in Houghton. Um, I will say that uh, we've heard from one member that uh, can't make the March 15, 16 date or the October 14, 15 date. So that's the only input I've had so far. Okay, well, it's uh, discussing the spring meeting. Uh, would everybody be in agreement if we can meet in person again that we just have in St. Ignace? If there's any objections to it, there's no need for a motion at this time. But if I don't hear any objections, we can uh, look at the date. You said you had uh, a member that had some uh, conflicts on March 15th and 16th. So can we scratch that one off? And we have February 11th and 12th, February 25th and 26th, and March 11th and 12th of 2001 to be held in St. Ignace. Is there any comment on those three particular dates in February or March? This is Bill Milliken. I've got a conflict on February 25 and 6. Well, then. No, we'll take take that one right off the list. How about that? Thank you. So we're down to 11 and 12 uh, in February and or March. I appreciate the fact that the input say Patty's Day on that. So, <laughs> I, I, 
<laughs> that would be a fun board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if uh, Kim, do you have any preference for uh, yourself or the staff? No. Okay. Well, a motion would be in order by somebody to either the February 12th or 11th and 12th or March 11th and 12th in 2001 to be held in St. Ignace. And I would accept that motion now if the board feels necessary to do so. Mr. Chairman, this is Kirk. I would make a motion that we make the uh, spring meeting March 11, 12th in St. Ignace. Your support to that motion? I support that, Caroline Cheeseman. Okay, thank you, Caroline. It's been moved and supported that we have the spring meeting March 11th and 12th in St. Ignace, Michigan. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, Kim, would you be kind enough to call a roll, please? Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Yes, over the squeaky chair. <laughs> <laughs> Director Ajaba? Yes. Member Seidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. Member Cheeseman? Yes. Thank you, Kim. Motion carried. Our next uh, spring or the spring meeting will be in St. Ignace on March 11th and 12th. And it appears that the summer meeting is cast in stone. Is that correct? July 8th and 9th? Yes, we already. The... Okay, yes. Good. And I, I would just like to uh, recommend that that fall meeting because actually we have just about a year to the day to uh, be concerned about that. Is just see how things shake out for the COVID situation. And we can always act on that in either the spring meeting or summer meeting. Everybody feel comfortable with that? Yes. Well, mm -hmm. well hearing me. no. Uh, Good. Hearing no objections. Uh, is there any other business to come before the authority by authority members? Anyone wish to bring any issues up for discussion? Here, I'll just move right ahead to public comment and I will call on James and Monica. Uh, have we received any public comment from today's meeting? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, our special email account that we set up to take public comment received one message overnight last night. It is from Susan Ramirez, spokesperson for the Old Glory Flag Run, uh, parentheses, Michigan group. Her note uh, reads as follows. Hello, on September or uh, apologies, on Saturday, October 17th at approximately 4 p.m., there will be an Old Glory flag run group of vehicles crossing the bridge from Lower Michigan. This will consist of an undetermined number of vehicles adorned with the American flag and likely other patriotic flags. The run, parentheses, group is actually being coordinated from three different locations in Lower Michigan that will be converging in Gaylord and heading north to the bridge as one. Members of the Old Glory Flag Run, parentheses Michigan, would like to request that the Mackinac Bridge Authority ensure that the American flag is being flown on the bridge at that time. We would also like to inform that there is the possibility of helicopters and drones flying overhead for media coverage. We would additionally like to request that you add this event to your website under event schedule. It would be titled as Old Glory Flag Run, parentheses, Michigan, on Saturday, October 17th, 2020, at 4 p.m. Thanking you in advance, Susan Ramirez. And Mr. Chair, I believe Monica has a public comment as well. Hello, this Thank is you. Monica. This is Monica Monsma, and we received a comment uh, during the meeting uh, from Diane Staley, uh, and it, it, it goes as follows. 
please revisit the driver assistance program. Any chance of it being reinstated? At present, I am paying $1,000 a month to get across the bridge plus bridge fare. Thank you. And that is the uh, end of public comments. Thank you. Tim, I would uh, ask on behalf of the board, unless uh, other authority members have any comment here, uh, that you take both these uh, situations into consideration. Uh, I'm not sure about the uh, request on the flag run, but uh, if there is a uh, high volume coming across the bridge, uh, we want to make sure that we're scheduling the toll takers to where we can expedite the traffic as soon as possible, as quick as possible, I should say. Yes, we will do that. Is there any other comment from anybody from the board? Hearing none, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved, Mr. Chair. Is there support to the, the motion to adjourn? Support. Been moved and supported that we adjourn the October 1st, 2020 Mackinac Bridge meeting. Jim, if you would uh, call the roll, please. Chair McGleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Yes. Director Ajaba? Yes. Member Steidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. And Member Cheeseman? Yes. Thank you all. And, uh, stay safe and mask up. And Jim, if you would, pass our appreciation to all the, or appreciation to all the staff members. Thank you. And yes, everyone have that. a good day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.